Dudley Kingsnorth. Dudley, how are you this morning? I'm well, thanks, Tracy. And how are you and your crew in Toronto? We are fabulous, and we thank you for doing this interview and this update on the overall rare earth market. So I'm going to start and get right into it with Linus and Molycor. Can you please give us an update on what's happening with both of uh, Linus and Molycor and how this is impacting rare earth forecast in general? I think probably for the last 12 or 15 months, we've been waiting for Linus and Mollycorp to finally trip the switch and start producing those rare earths. That's happening now, and I think this is going to lead to a great rejuvenation or rebirth of the rare earth industry. We're now going to have diversity of supply that we probably haven't had for 15 years. And with Mollycorp and Linus coming online, that's, that's going to change. All the money that's being invested in, in finding alternatives for rare earths, I think, within the next three, four months is going to turn back to finding new applications for, for rare earths. And, and I actually believe that uh, Linus and Molycorp are going to surprise us with some of the volumes they're producing and, and selling over the next six to 12 months, because there is a lot of support out there for alternatives to, to China. All right. And then so what about these forecasts? JP Morgan just put out a research report, and I believe their forecasts were 30 percent less than yours. So I'm inclined, of course, to believe you, Dudley, over JP Morgan. Can you explain the discrepancy in these two forecasts? That's very flattering, uh, Tracy, but uh, I'll give you a bit, of, a bit of background to that. Look, I, I watch uh, the rare earth market fairly closely, and I, and I talk to both the end users and, and the producers. And I think Probably what's happened is people have underestimated in the past the amount that China sold in 2010-2011 when we saw that huge hike in prices, which is accompanied by uncertainties of supply. As a result of that, the West built up huge stocks of, of rare earths, and I think that's probably equivalent to about three or four years' uh, consumption. Now, over the last few years, we've seen what's happened China has really clamped down on, on illegal mining and supply, and that's really having an impact on the material that's available coming out of China. Those stocks have been run down. But when you look at it, people would say, well, you know, maybe I look at metal pages or I look at Asia Metal, the prices are coming down and the volumes don't look that great. But I think what happened was in 2010, 2011, Companies bought a lot of that illegal material that came out of China. They're now getting towards the end of that material. And, and so we're going to see a big pickup in, in purchases towards the end of this year. I going to think we're going to see a recovery in prices in the fourth period of the year. That more importantly, we're going to see a return to, to the volumes that we saw a few years ago. In spite of all that reduction of supply coming out of China, if we'd had the same reduction in the demand for hybrid vehicles, iPads, mobile phones, we would have had millions of people laid off. That hasn't happened. The growth in the demand for those consumer items, which consume a lot of rare earths, has remained unchanged. And that, to me, is fundamental to the fact that rare earth consumption has remained very much the same over the past few years. It hasn't fallen. JP Morgan might have a different view, but my view is that it's remained very much the same. And we're now in a situation where those stocks that were built up in, in a sense of panic in a way in 2010, 2011, are now being run down. And we're going to see a rebirth and rejuvenation of the industry in the end of this year, beginning of next year. Thank you for the very positive messaging, Dudley. And so with that and with the demand, you talk about technology as a major variable for the increase in the forecast. Can you talk to me a little bit more about this? The, the change in, in demand for rare earths is impacted very much more by changes in technology on a plus and, and minus side than, than the actual growth in the market. When, when I first started in the rare earth industry some 20, 25 years ago, cerium was, was the rare earth that was driving the industry. Uh, and that was because it was used in, in cathode ray tubes or, or CRTs to both polish them and in the glass itself. Now, those have been replaced by LCDs and PDPs, and we've seen that the demand for serum has fallen. At about the same time, well, in the late 1980s, we see the, saw the development of rare earth magnets, and since then, the demand for neodymium and praseodymium, and to a certain extent, dysprosium, has, has driven the market. So that's, that's all been very positive. At the moment, 
we're in a situation where LED lighting is replacing a lot of fluorescent lighting and the impact that that's going to have on the demand for heavy rare earths, I'm not sure. I do know it is going to have an impact, but nobody's too sure about what it's going to have. So that's going to kick, that's going to have an impact, a negative impact, unfortunately, on the demand uh, for, for heavy rare earths. On the other hand, we, we're all being very aware that the uh, lanthanum nickel hydride batteries are probably going to be replaced by lithium ion batteries. They've had a few hiccups in, in the success of applying these lithium ion batteries. So I think that uh, on, on, uh, for quite a different reason, we're going to see continued demand for lanthanum in the near future, particularly in, in batteries. And they're not, it's not going to be replaced as soon as we thought uh, by, by lithium. Well, Dudley, thank you so much for joining us again today.